Welcome, guys, to the next episode of the Better Wallet Podcast. As you guys know, the Better Wallet Podcast is all about mystifying the topic of money and sharing powerful money stories from people who truly beat the odds. In the last episode of the Barrel Podcast, I introduced you guys to the Secure Act 2.0 changes. If you missed it, be sure to check out episode 43. It's a really big change that is completely disrupting the retirement industry and a few other industries. And I want you guys to be in the know. A lot of these changes are taking effect next year, but I want you guys to know about this stuff now. One of the biggest changes is regarding how unused 529 assets can be used if your child does not use the money. They do not go to college. They do not use the money for higher educational um, purposes. And as you guys know by now, or you may not know, a 529 is a tax advantage investing account used for higher education. One of the biggest challenges of the account is that you, if your child doesn't get a higher education for whatever reason, other than transferring the money to another family member, you using that money or taking the money out and, you know, incurring a penalty, right? Like this new rule change allows you to take the money out and roll it over into a Roth IRA instead. And in this episode, we're gonna dive deep into that just so you know how you can help your kids get a head start on retirement. To help break down the rule change, I wanted to bring on one of my buddies. His name is Ryan Francis to discuss the topic a little further. For those who don't know, Ryan is an online finance creator where he drops all kinds of helpful money tips. And he's also the co-founder of moneydime.com that connects top realtors and lenders to home buyers, which is pretty cool. He has been featured in Forbes. He's been featured in CNBC, the Today Show, Bankery, and he is also a soon to be dad. So I thought it would be very topical to, you know, kind of talk about this and how he plans on implementing this with his soon to be his son here in, in June. I wanted to bring Ryan on because over the holiday, when all the news dropped about the Secure Act 2.0 and the $1.7 trillion spending bill from Congress, during the holidays, he and I were nerding out throughout the DMs, just talking about all the changes. And I thought it'd be cool to have a nerd out session on the Better Wallet podcast so you guys know about all the changes regarding Secure Act 2.0, more specifically the 529 changes. So in this episode, we'll discuss Ryan's money journey, his entrepreneurial journey, and also dive into 529 accounts and how he plans on using them for his new family. Before we dive into the episode, guys, please do me a favor and write a review for the Better Wallet podcast. It may seem really small to you, but it actually has a really big impact on the success of the podcast. As you guys may or may not know, the podcast takes a lot of time, a lot of hours, a lot of money to produce. So taking a few hours out of your day will really mean the world to me and help us keep going. So thank you guys in advance for writing a review. And with that, let's get into the episode. Welcome to the Better Wallet Podcast, a podcast where we talk to everyday people who have changed their lives through managing their money. We talk about their money journeys, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Welcome everyone to the next episode of the Better Wallet Podcast. As you guys know, the Better Wallet Podcast is all about mystifying the topic of money and sharing powerful money stories from people who truly beat the odds. Today, we have my guy, Ryan Francis, on the line. If you don't know who Ryan Francis is, you better get to know him. He's doing a lot of great things on the in the online space and then also in the real estate space as well, as we kind of talked about in the bio. But Ryan, thank you for coming on to the podcast, and I'm looking forward to learning more about your story. Thanks for having me, Mark. I'm super excited to be on. Yes, sir. So... The reason on why, or one of the reasons on why Ryan and I connected early on is that I want to say maybe like 2020, maybe 2019, I'm trying to think of the right year, but it was during the pandemic, I feel there were a bunch of pages mm -hmm. online that were basically teaching everyone about finance. It was me, it was you, it was like some of our homies that, you know, we talked yeah. to every day through the DMs. And you start to really grow close to these people from like a business standpoint, a personal standpoint. And then you find out that you've never actually met them in person. <laughs> so <laughs> I, we were able to connect for the first time at FinCon, and, which is 
pretty much a financial conference for money nerds that happens annually. And it was like my first time actually meeting him. But the cool thing about it is like, you actually feel like you've like met these people, like anyone, you know, already. You just so happen to not see them like in person. Yeah, I feel like we've been friends for years already and we had just met in person for the first time. It's super interesting because like, it's kind of the same thing with a lot of the people I meet online. Like they're super genuine same people that you you meet on in person are the same as they are on the internet so it's pretty cool to to meet you and yeah it felt like i you know we hadn't skipped a beat yeah exactly like we've known each other our entire lives yeah. but it's cool like the cool thing about going to conferences like that is that i personally feel that conferences like fincon is like the only time where i'm around all the people who are just like me we just like the <laughs> talk money and talk business and we just so happen to like to drink and eat and just have a good and we're all like either extroverts that are true extroverts or introverts that fake extroversion so it's really cool <laughs> hanging out with each other but yeah that's how we met and now we're you know on the podcast together which is really cool so ryan i really want to get into your story i was able to look through your website and learn a lot about you that I frankly didn't know about before. Let's talk about where it all began. Like, talk to us about your childhood through high school. Like, where does this whole money journey come from? Yeah, so my parents moved here in 86 and I wasn't born yet. And <laughs> they, they started from nothing. They It's kind of crazy to think about. They just up and rooted their lives, came to the US with nothing and figured out a way to, to kind of live. So they, my dad's first job was at Taco Bell and uh, he, <laughs> my parents and, you know, they both worked just really crappy low end jobs, but we're still able to provide for a family of five. You know, they, we didn't have, we didn't have much growing up, but you know, you know, my parents didn't give me money, but what they gave me was really good work ethic. They, you know, they, you know, as you know, like immigrant parents, they work like no other, like 80 hour a week, you know, no excuses, you know, kids, you know, kids take care of the kids when they're like, they're five years old, my sister could take care of me and they were off to work to, to provide. So I saw like a really good work ethic and, you know, we always had what we needed, but there wasn't much more of it. So, you know, in order to kind of make that happen on such low income, so my parents had to be super frugal, you know, they had to say no to, to most things, but they found a way to, you know, to get by and provide and, you know, you know, create a good home for us. And, uh, you know, that, that frugality played a huge part in kind of my financial journey. So fast forward, you know, I went to college, I had, you know, it was half of it was split between scholarships. The other half though was student loans. I didn't have, I didn't have any help from my parents. I couldn't help, you know, if, if they, you know, if they could, they would have, but you know, it, it, that, that frugality played a huge part when I graduated college. You know, I continued to live like a college student. You know, I moved to New Orleans when I first graduated college, and that's kind of when my financial journey started. You know, it's actually kind of crazy the way I picked my college major. I didn't really have any mentors. Um, I just knew I wanted to make money because we didn't, we, I didn't come from money. So I literally looked up the highest paying major, which at the time was petroleum engineering. I'm like, I'm going to study that. That was literally the only thing that went into my decision about same college. thing for my major. <laughs> I was like, how can I make money? I cannot yeah. graduate from here and not have yeah. a high paying job. <laughs> like, yeah. Exactly. Awesome. So, so that's what I did. So luckily, you know, I graduated college. I did well, graduated in four years, summers. I worked throughout all of school, you know, just to make extra money, to reduce the burden of student loans as much as I could, but I still graduated with around 40,000 of student loan debt. And so, you know, I spent, you know, I'd saved up through college, through various jobs, um, you know, a few thousand bucks. And I used that to get to New Orleans. So the company that I was, you know, moving to New Orleans with wasn't paying for relocation. So I had to pay for that and just kind of make it by to get my first paycheck. So I had like spent most of my money to get over to New Orleans. And I was just, I had a, you know, I waited, you know, a few weeks to get that first paycheck. And I didn't take any time off after school because I, I needed the money. So 
you know, within a couple of weeks of graduation, I was already moved to a new city and started my new job. And so that's kind of where my financial journey started. I didn't really know, you know, I, I didn't know about finances. All I really knew was like how to be super frugal, you know, not, how to not spend money, but I didn't know how to pay off debt, how to save, how to invest, how to build an emergency fund, just general principles of personal finance. I knew that I wanted better for myself. I knew that, you know, negative 40K was not a good, not a good place to be. And I knew I wanted better. Exactly. And just two context questions. So where did your parents immigrate from? Yeah. So my parents moved here from Egypt to Houston. From Egypt. Got it. And yeah. then where did you go to college? University of Houston. University of Houston. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I'm just kind of curious just for the, uh, for the listeners. So I, one, one key takeaway from that is that I think a lot of times, cause I also come from absolutely nothing, but when I think back to what I actually learned and what I did get from my parents, it was exactly what you just mentioned, like that hard working mm. attitude and work ethic and, you know, doing things honestly, I'm just trying to think of everything. I mean, that and being extremely frugal, it was nothing mm -hmm. for us to try to find a way to survive off of $50 a week. And we had a big mm -hmm. family, you know, all that. I have to say, like, I still use that today. And that has mm -hmm. helped, helped me get throughout college. It helped me to pay off my debt. And also, mm -hmm. you know, it helps me in the professional world, you know, being a business yeah. owner have to have those traits because if not you will drown so you you came out of school forty thousand dollars of debt which is nothing to sneeze at right came out with fifty thousand in in student loans and kind of went through a similar process you know how would you able to how were you able to pay all that off like i think there's you know there's probably people on the line that you know probably have yeah. credit card debt or they have student loan debt or maybe a car loan <clears throat> what were some of the key factors to paying off forty thousand dollars of debt yeah. So I want to go back a little further because that's kind of where the journey starts as well. And it wasn't just the frugality that I, you know, I got at home. One thing that my parents pushed really hard was education. So they, you know, they pushed us super hard in school. Like they were not okay with bees, <laughs> you know? So like my whole life, they were slamming down the hammer on me to do well in school. And so, you know, you know, if you grow up in a low income family, you don't have connections to wealthy people. So the business world is just something that you'll, you never see as a child. And so the only path that my parents really knew to better, you know, our lives was education. So they pushed that really hard and I was able to get into a good school, you know, do well in school and then graduate and get a good job. So my first job at a college, I was making 75000 a year. And so that was a really good start. You know, I think it was more than my parents ever made. Um, you know, it, that was the highest income, you know, more than they did in, you know, their 30 years in the U.S. So, so that was a great start. So the first thing I did was get on a budget. I needed to understand what my expenses were. So like I, when I moved there, I found the cheapest possible apartment I could in New Orleans. It was like 700 bucks. And I don't think my expenses were total. You know, I, uh, I had a, you know, a 2008 Honda bunch of miles and it was paid for, you know, insurance was cheap. You know, I meal prepped every meal. I did not eat out unless I was with my fiance at the time, now wife. And I, my expenses were probably a thousand bucks a month, maybe 1200. Wow. And so, you know, I'm making, you know, take home like four, 4,500 a month or so. And so I'm, I have an excess of, you know, $3,000 or so. And so, um, on top of that, you know, I, you know, I started paying off, I saved $5,000 first. That was my, the first thing I did because I wanted to create some sort of buffer between me and, you know, I, I didn't want a flat tire to <laughs> bankrupt me. So <laughs> yeah, so, so I got, I, you know, I saved 5,000 within a couple months and I'm like, all right, now it's time to, to get on it. So I started paying off my debt, you know, 3,000 a month. I was like, man, this is slower than I want. I want to be out of here within a year. So, so I put my, you know, my engineering degree to practice and I started tutoring people in math and science. And so I was making 50, hundred bucks an hour doing that. Just, you know, I'd go to work during the day. I'd come back and I'd tutor if I was home on the weekends and not visiting my fiance. I was also tutoring. And so mm -hmm. I was able to, you know, increase my income by a good amount. I was making, you know, an extra few hundred bucks a week. 
And so that allowed me to really, you know, accelerate that debt payoff journey. So, you know, I kept my expenses extremely low. Like I just, it's crazy to think back because now I spend a lot of money. I also make, you know, a lot more. And so, but I just think back, like I was living on a thousand bucks a month. It was, I was good. I was happy. You know, I just had the necessities. Like I went to the gym for fun. I didn't really do much else though, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I, I worked. The fun and, happiness I, tends to change over time as well. Yeah. Because yeah. When I was coming up, you know, my first few years in corporate, you know, I was making, you know, what, like 60,000 at Vanguard, which was much more than what my parents made collectively at the height of their careers. And what, def what I defined as happiness was going and eating Indian food every week. That was my mm, thing. Um, yeah. Now it's, I'd much rather go on a trip somewhere and eat Indian food than, yeah. you know, so yeah. like vacations are a big part of like what I like to do yeah. or just travel. And mm -hmm. that is expensive. But I hear you. Like I had an apartment when I was paying off debt, I was paying $600. Nice. I, I would never recommend anyone to live where I lived because it was <laughs> not the best of situations. Yeah. I'm going to ask you first, and then I'll give you my story about like $600 apartment, $600 a month apartment. But like, did you have any, so you're in the middle of New Orleans, right? <laughs> uh, did you have yeah. any critters at all? I did have insects that I had to call them for, but okay. they just basically like, they didn't fix much, you know, like <laughs> their definition of fixing stuff was painting mm -hmm. over issues, literally like the entire apartment, like all they did between tenants was mm -hmm. paint it, <laughs> repaint wow. it. They painted the counters, the walls, they painted the door handles. The door handles. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. They paint the yeah. outlets too? <laughs> they did all like i'm like that's wow okay but like when i got the apartment it was filthy my mom and dad had flown over to to help move me in and we spent an entire day <laughs> just cleaning the apartment it was like it was crazy but like it was you know it was a little studio i had i had a bed i had a tv in there i had a bathroom and like the kitchen was like you know five square feet so i had enough to like chop my food and throw it on the you know stove top to cook it so it was like it was so crazy like you know but it was worse than i was living in college actually because i lived on campus at the time and so i was you know i had a pretty decent dorm i had a meal plan now i had you know a worse place and then i also had you know to cook my own food <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not a good cook. So, yeah. but I, you know, I figured it out. I meal prepped. So every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I made myself. I was not eating out. I, I kind of saved that for the weekend when I was with, you know, my fiance, if I was visiting, if I wasn't, you know, I was still eating meal prep meals. Every now and then I would get a pizza uh, from Domino's and that was like five bucks. So, um, so I was so it, cheap. <laughs> yeah. I think that's so important though, like increasing yeah. your income, you know, because income can be, you know, endless. And then also decreasing mm -hmm. your expenses. Obviously, the easiest thing yeah. to do is go mm -hmm. and decrease your expenses. That's normally what I would go and recommend yeah. for people. And then try yeah. to find a way to increase your income based off of things that you actually love to do. So I yeah. assume you love being a math tutor is something you're really good at. But there are some people that are just like, oh, well, I need, I want to, you know, sell, I don't know, whatever it's hot to, you know, whatever it might mm -hmm. be hot to sell online nowadays or like maybe it'll say oh i want to you know i don't know like have vending machines and i don't even <laughs> care about yeah. vending machines at all right like you want to find something that you're really passionate about, and that way it doesn't feel like you're working one one quick story and then i'll let you continue with your story mm -hmm. so i did the same thing right so when i was paying off debt from 20 2014 to 2018 in my head I said to myself, I need to find ways to decrease my biggest expenses. For me, it was going out to eat. It was my, where I lived and then my car. So paid off my car during that time. I cut out like going out to eat and just, you know, partying all the time. And I also decreased my rent expense by living in a place where I was only paying $600 a month. Your situation where you just had a couple critters, like, <laughs> so so my situation was I moved in and I didn't know until afterwards that it was com like almost infested with bugs that will not name on this podcast. <laughs> also mice, which oh, over time, that's, yeah, that 
right. and I won't recommend it at all. Like, make sure you guys know for the listeners, make sure you know what the lowest amount you <laughs> should pay to be in your city. In Philly, mm-hmm. I learned that anything below $900, you're asking for it. And I was at <laughs> six. So it was normal to walk in and see a mouse just run by your feet. And I endured that for, an, I never like really talked about this, but like I endured that for an entire year because I wanted to pay off debt. And mm. I would not recommend that at all. Find other ways. <laughs> expense. Be like Ryan and find an actual <laughs> decent place. But that's a backstory. But it helped me pay off a lot of debt. I saved a good, let's say $1,000 per month, which was cool and really helped to pay off a lot of my debts. But that's a backstory. But so yeah. you're frugal during that time. You're able to lower how much you paid for your house. You had, do you have a pay off, paid off car at that point? I did. I had my Honda at the yep. time. And so, yeah, so that helped me like crazy. And mm-hmm. so I was able to get, you know, get my income up to six figures, you know, with that first year out of college, cause I was working so much. So I had my job plus side hustles and uh, that helped me pay off my debt within a year and build an emergency fund. So like, you know, I was able to save a lot. And then shortly after that, you know, within a year, I was able to get a new job, which I got like a f- at least over a 50% raise. And then, you know, that helped me. Plus I continued to do the side hustles and I was able to increase my income quite a bit, you know, save up a lot because my wife also had student loans. So when we got married, you know, I was able to, you know, we were able to pay it off immediately. And so that was, you know, we started off our marriage within a couple months of marriage. We were completely debt free. We had our emergency fund. We were living in a, in, you know, in, in a nicer apartment and, you know, life was good. You know, we had a lot of excess money. We we're mm-hmm. investing a lot. We we're saving a lot because we wanted to buy a house and then COVID hit. And so, you know, by that point, you know, it was, you know, things were scary, you know, but we were in such a good financial position at that time. You know, we had, you know, we, we had a ton of savings, you know, we were investing, we had no debt, we, you know, our expenses were still very low. And so when COVID hit, we were able to, everything was okay. We didn't fear it as, you know, as much as other people, because we, we had, you know, good cash reserves and we we're in a good financial place. And so, you know, at that point, you know, like I, I was like, you know, I'd consumed so much personal finance content that I felt like I, I knew the path. I knew what you needed to do to get from extremely broke to wealthy. Like I was on the path. We were in great shape. And, you know, a lot of friends and family were asking me how I did it, you know? And so, you know, originally I just started trying to help people one-on-one and, you know, just, I was super passionate about it. And, and I loved it and I continued to do it. And I just, I realized after some time helping a bunch of people, this stuff is not very well known. It's the same stuff over and over. People don't know what they're doing. They, you know, we go through life and we don't know what we're doing. Like I didn't know how to manage money until, you know, I, I, I self-educated a little backstory to that. I want to take a quick break from the episode to discuss one of the biggest crises we're facing today. The crisis is the lack of financial literacy. When you made your first paycheck, did anyone tell you what to do with it? Probably not. This is why 63% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck and get this, half of which make more than six figures. So what I did was I took my expertise as a retired financial advisor and industry professional to give you a complete financial checklist that you can use to get your finances in order in less than 10 minutes. It's completely free and I have a link in my show notes. I want you to take complete command of your financial future this year and this checklist is gonna help you get started. Okay, let's get back to the episode. When I was living in New Orleans for a year, you know, and Laura, my fiance at the time, was in Houston. And so nearly every weekend I was driving back. And don't, I don't recommend this, the worst drive ever, six, six, seven, eight hours each way. And so I was in the car for at least 12 hours a weekend. Wow. And instead of music, I was just listening to podcasts. I was listening to audiobooks. That's where my life changed in a year, actually just 10 months of that commute, at least three weekends a month. I learned more than I did in, you know, my entire life about money. 
And that's what helped accelerate so much of my debt paying journey. You know, I knew what I needed to do. You know, I knew it, it helped continue to drive me to, to work hard and, you know, not have a life for a year to, to pay that debt off. And it helped me, you know, learn where to put my money, what, how to put it in the right places. And I just learned so much. And, you know, it allowed me to help a lot of friends and family and put me in a good financial position. And all of that together just made me want to help more people. And so, you know, when COVID hit, you know, a lot of people lost their jobs and, you know, I was helping more friends and family there. My, my wife actually got laid off. We were completely fine because we were in a good financial position. And, uh, you know, this all contributed to the content I was putting out on social media. I was like, I, I want to help people because if I didn't learn this, I would be a mess. I would still be in debt. I probably wouldn't have any money saved. And I'd be lost and it would suck, especially with people losing their jobs, things being so uncertain at the time. And so that's when I, you know, I started around, you know, I think early 2020 sharing on social media and the same questions kept coming up. Like, what order do I do things? Do I pay off debt first? Do I invest? Do I build an emergency fund? The same questions came up. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to write a book, step-by-step -step guide exactly what to do, you know, A to Z. And I did that. That was kind of what I did for six months during that year when I was making content. I was like, I want to just create a guide that anyone can pick up and just know exactly what to do, where to do it, how to do it, when to do it, everything. Right. And so that's what I did. And that's initially how I, you know, I, I sold it super cheap, but I was able to start monetizing and making money online. So like, I, I didn't actually intend for, you know, my social media to become a business. I just wanted to help people. And uh, it ended up, you know, I ended up making some money. And then, you know, 2021 came around and same story, like, you know, you know, so many business opportunities came around and uh, just so many opportunities to make money came up that, you know, I saw the need for a lot of things and I, you know, tried to create businesses around them. And so 2021 was another huge year for growth and then 2022 as well. And here we are. So, you know, I've been in this world for, you know, about three years now in the social media, the business world um, for three years, but it feels like it's been a decade. You know, yeah. I feel like, you know, the hard work didn't stop. You know, I feel like I've gotten smarter and working smarter, but the hard work never stopped. You know, I've historically worked too much and it's something that I've had to find balance with, as I'm sure you, you probably struggle with too. It's just something about, you know, entrepreneurship that is so exciting and fun that you just want to, it's, it's so fun that you want to do it all the time. And then it just consumes your life. So, you, so anyone listening, you know, try to find balance if you can, but it's extremely hard and I struggle with it. Yeah, but, I totally agree. I mean, it's, it's challenging. I mean, especially given that you like, if you really love what you do, it doesn't actually feel like work. Like I can mm. work all day and I don't get tired. I won't get tired at five. I have another problem that I'm able to solve for the business. And a yep. lot of times when you're solving the problems, you can think back and say, okay, well, here's how I'm going to be compensated for solving mm. X problem. You know, when you started like your side business, you probably said, okay, well, if I'm able to build this ebook, I'll likely receive X amount of dollars to compensate me for my mm. time and expertise. In the same time, I also get to help a lot of people who hopefully go off and teach other people different financial topics. So, yeah, it's really interesting. Like hearing your story, it's crazy how similar the stories are for a lot of the other finance creators that really started in, you know, 2019, 2020. We all learned a lot about, you know, paying off our own debt, starting to invest. And we really started off like having it as like a passion project. We say, okay, well, we're going to go and we're going to help out all these people because these are all the things that we learned. And we found out that it wasn't just our family members that dealt with these issues. It's the entire state, it's the entire country, it's the entire mm. world. And it was fun just try. it still is fun just trying to find a way to help people manage their money better so you can invest more for their families. Mm. So that is awesome. So now you're on this more of like an entrepreneurial journey. You have a completely separate company now, Home Dime. So kind of talk to everyone about that and how that's going. Yeah. So in, in 2020, actually, we, we, we had started shopping for a house in 
2019 and uh, it was a hassle like trying to find you know a good realtor it was like i'd gone through a few and all they i just felt like they were all just pressuring me to buy a house buy a house interest rates are never gonna get lower <laughs> okay like i i don't but the, like i don't do well with what pressure like i'm i'm not gonna make a decision because you're pressuring me those high pressure sales tactics don't work so i'm like all right I'll just find another realtor so i you know i went and found other ones and they all sucked eventually i found one realtor that was really good super patient and kind of put, you know, my needs first. So like, you know, there were a few houses I almost put an offer on that he's like, probably not going to be a good decision. Turns out it was, it wasn't until like mid 2020 that, you know, I ended up putting an offer on a house I liked. God knows that was perfect timing, super lucky, but yeah. just the experience of going through the process with a really good realtor was awesome, but also a hassle to, to get there. It took a while to find the right person. You know, luckily I wasn't in a rush, but it was just like, man, I'm using all these recommendations. I'm looking online and all these people suck. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, there's got to be a better way to find a good realtor. So, you know, I sat down with my realtor and I was like, Hey man, like, you know, a lot of people are asking, cause I was sharing along the way, the home buying process. I built a new construction home. So I was kind of sharing the process. It took six months. So I was sharing a lot of it on social media. And I kept getting people asking me like, hey, how do I find a good realtor? And it's like, you know, like, I, I don't know. There, there's just, there's too many sites that have it. There's, uh, you know, everyone has a recommendation. Everyone has an aunt that sells one home a year part-time <laughs> that they think are the best. And I was like, there's got to be a better way. So, you know, I partnered with my realtor I was like, let's, let's help people find a good realtor. They have to be, you know, they have to do a lot of volume. This has to be their full-time job. I don't want any part-time realtors. The other part of it is they have to be super responsive. They have to be good with people. And so we came together and started a company called homedime.com. And so basically what we do is we connect people with really good realtors. So we interviewed thousands of realtors and built a really good network of just the best realtors all across the U.S. And, you know, there's a bunch of criteria that we established that they needed to have. And we interviewed everyone and we built this really awesome network of really good realtors. So like if you go to our site, you're going to get someone good. There's, it's not like Zillow where you just go and anyone, every realtor on that is listed there. No, it's like, it's only a select few of the good ones. So that was our goal to just connect people with a good realtor to, to offer a, you know, you know, a good experience during the home buying process. Cause there's so much that goes into it. There's so much that I've learned by having a good realtor versus like all the other ones are like, just buy this. They didn't share. They didn't teach me anything about the process. There's so much there's inspections, there's appraisals, there's, you know, mortgages that like I wasn't, going to buy a house with cash. So I needed to understand what a mortgage was and what went into it and all these different stupid little fees that, you know, <laughs> that go into it. Yeah. And so like just having that kind of like expert guide me there was super awesome. So I just wanted to create that for other people and, you know, share it with my audience and, and others as well. And it's a completely free service. So basically for the end user, you can just go there, get connected with a really good realtor and then you know, go buy your house or sell your house. And it's a really good experience. So that's what we've created. And yeah, so it uh, took a lot of hard work there. That was probably. Yeah. You're a ghost was, for like a couple of months. I was like, where the hell is Ryan? And you're like, yeah. it seems like you were like working on that for some time. Yeah. It was like, we were getting closer to launch and I was like, I was so behind on what we needed to do. So we bootstrapped this thing. You know, mm -hmm. I have you know, I have a lot of coding background. So I was doing the, the back end coding and the automations and just all that fun stuff. And I was also, you know, doing the marketing for it too. And so that was like, I was just so behind on everything. So I just kind of, I was working 15 hour days for at least three months straight. I mean, what just you getting to launch. What you've been able to produce is like really good. I, so before the show, guys, I jumped onto the website, obviously doing my research and jumped onto the website. And I'm like, oh man, this is actually like really good. Like, I, I mean, I'm not surprised, you know, really <laughs> straightforward to the point. And exactly what Ryan is mentioning is exactly what the website offers, where you guys know my story. I moved down here from Philadelphia. I'm down here in Atlanta, still kind of learning about 
the whole real estate space and God, if I could just have a realtor, a good realtor come up and say, hey, here's everything you need to know, that would be a godsend. And frankly, I've talked to a couple of realtors here already in Atlanta, and I don't think they're all too great. Like either they just moved down here or they just don't really understand the landscape. So that was a big issue. And the cool thing with the website is that you go in, you put in your zip code, you can Tell them, hey, like, you know, I don't want to buy right now or you want to buy within the next couple months. And it's a really easy and straightforward process. And I haven't looked at my emails yet, but I'm pretty sure I probably have like an email and maybe even connecting me with a realtor already. So I'm excited for that. And I also don't like people selling me. Like I like people to give me options and tell me what I need to know and allow yeah. me to make a decision. And I'm happy to hear that who you guys are looking for and who you guys interviewed. Yeah, whether you use Home Dime to find a realtor or you're just interviewing someone you know or refer, whatever it is, you know, make sure that you're asking the right questions. If you feel like there's someone's pressuring you or that they're not sharing enough info, get a new realtor. Like there, there's plenty of them around. And yep. like it, it's so, it's one of the biggest purchases you'll ever make. So don't take it lightly. Like, there's so much that goes into it that you just want to make sure you're well informed and take your time. You know, don't rush into things. There's so much that can go wrong. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, it's like you just want to make sure you're doing your due diligence. And that's all that, you know, a good realtor helps you do that. Amen. Partner with the right people. So let's actually kind of transition to another big milestone in, in your life. You mentioned at first that, you know, you buy a home, the next big milestone <laughs> is normally you know a kid so ryan <laughs> is he's gonna be welcoming a baby boy here in june of this year and i'm trying to get him to wait until june 19th for my birthday but that's <laughs> selfish but he's welcoming a baby boy he and his wife laura and we so ryan and i were talking a little bit about 529 accounts and some of the changes that are being made with the 529 accounts, specifically with how you can roll over use leftover funds. And this was during, I should put it out there. This was during Christmas when we should have probably been with family. We're like nerding out <laughs> the Secure Act changes. So that's what we do when we should be eating cake and, and enjoying time with family during the holidays. But anyhow, so in the last episode, guys, we we're talking about the Secure Act 2.0, setting every community up for retirement enhancement changes, which is a part of a $1.7 trillion spending bill from Capitol Hill. For most people, that probably bores the hell out of you. Just like, hey, look, I don't really need to know this stuff. So we're going to try to break this down so you understand how it really impacts you specifically as it relates to a 529. Why Ryan and I were having this conversation beyond the fact that we're nerds is that, you know, him having a baby boy really puts things in perspective and now the clock is ticking, right? So you have a little over 18 years to prepare, you know, said child for education and 529 plans tend to be a pretty good route of going about, you know, investing for college and for anyone who doesn't know what a 529 plan is, it's basically, if you compare it to like a traditional brokerage or investment account, with a traditional brokerage or investment account, you put money in and the money grows, you know, you make sure you're, you have it invested, the money grows. And then when you take the money out, you're taxed on the earnings. That's standard. With a 529 account, you put money in after tax, it grows tax-free. And when you take it out for qualified higher educational purposes, you do not have to pay taxes on that amount. So for anyone listening, you're probably like, yeah, duh, like that sounds like a great idea. Like we should all put money into a 529 plan. Here's a challenge. You put money into a 529 account, it grows tax-free, you take it out for qualified expenses. What if that child says, you know, mom and dad, I'm not going to go off to college or I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to get a higher education beyond high school. What do you do with that money? I mean, hopefully, you know, yeah. <laughs> hopefully your yeah. son doesn't have to you know, he, yeah. he pay that, but you know, who knows? I mean, your kids can you know do whatever they want when they turn 18. So this change, Secure Act 2.0, one of the changes within Secure Act 2.0 is that now with the 529 assets, instead of just keeping within the 529 or transferring it to a family member or you going off to school or 
taking out and paying a 10% penalty on their earnings, now you're able to roll over this money into a Roth IRA for the child, which is a really big deal because now you get to say, okay, well, this was originally earmarked for college. This money is now going to be earmarked for retirement and it's a Roth IRA. And as you guys know, at 59 and a half, they wouldn't have to pay taxes on the earnings with the Roth IRA, which is huge. Obviously there's mm. exceptions to the rules. There are exceptions to the exceptions, but in general, that's what it's all about. The cool thing with Brian also is that prior to all the different changes, he wasn't a big fan of 529s. And I thought we can maybe start there and talk about what you didn't like about 529 accounts. And then we can dive into how those changes might have changed your perspective on it. Yeah. So, so previously 529s were a big black box for education. If you don't go to school, you can't use it for, or you can use it, but you're going to be taxed and penalized to eternity on it. So it's going to destroy any potential gains you had there. So 529, I always thought of, and this is what it was for. It was a college savings account, college investment account. I did a video on this in 2021. I said, I'm not going to save for my kid's college. <laughs> I said this before I ever knew my wife was pregnant. And uh, things have changed. You know, I said instead, you know, I'm going to invest into an, a, a custodial account. So, you know, the, it's not tax advantage for college, but they can use the money for whatever they want. If they want to go to college, they can use the money for that. If they want to start a business, they can use the money for that. If they want to buy real estate, they can use the money for that. So that was my original intent. And I'm still leaning toward that way. But I may still contribute some money to a 529 because now if you don't use it, you can just roll it to a Roth IRA. And so I might, I, you know what I might end up doing is just a split. Maybe I'll do some in a, into a 529 and some into a, a custodial account. And then, yeah, so, so I know there's limits on the Roth or on the 529. So I may just do, you know, a, a small amount that'll grow and then because you can't roll over more than 35,000. So if you want to save a hundred thousand for your kid, you know, I would try, you know, not save more than it would grow to, I, you know, I wouldn't want to go over 35,000 in that account. So anything more than that, I would do it in a custodial account. So, so yeah. For anyone who's listening, they're just like, Ryan, what the fuck is a custodial account? Could you break that it's, down? Like, the Yeah, it's, it's basically an account that you are the custodian of. You, you invest on behalf of your child. When they turn 18, it becomes theirs. So that's all it is. It's like a, it's like a, just a regular investment account, but for your kid, you manage it until, till they're 18. Yep. They turn the age of majority and then it transfers over to them. So into a, basically the, you know, a, a brokerage account. Yeah. And Ryan mentioned it, you know, there's definitely, as I mentioned, ex exceptions to the rules or exceptions to the exceptions. One, you mentioned the $35,000 lifetime limit where you can't roll over more than that amount. Number one, number two, your 529 account has to have existed for more than 15 years. So you like, let's say, you know, do you have a name for your baby boy yet? We're not that? sure. We're in between a couple of names, so I, I'm not going to say it yet. But you're not going to put on the we're, podcast. We're, it's not going to be a bear uh, wallet podcast exclusive. <laughs> so I'm going to name the baby Ryan Jr. Okay. RJ. So RJ. <laughs> yeah. So RJ, you know, he's going to have enough time of like having a 529 account where you can do the rollover, but you have to have it for 15 years, which I think is probably one of the biggest limitations of this. And then also the contribution slash earnings have to be made within the last five years, or I'm sorry, the contributions or earnings made within the last five years cannot be rolled over. So I think that could be pretty limiting for that exception to the rules. But so it might make sense in that case if I put like, I don't know, five grand, I'll do the math, so mm -hmm. a seven or 10% return. Let's just say it's five grand that it'll turn into 35 grand. So maybe I'll put five or 10 grand in when they're like born. And by the time they go to college, it'll be at around 30, 35 grand. Then I can roll it over. But right. I, it wouldn't be like a regular contribution thing versus a, a custodial account. I would do that regularly so that over time it could, you know, there's no limit on how much that could grow to. 
Yeah. And I guess the other option would be, let's say your child goes off to private school in Houston, you could also use the money for that, sure. you know, uniforms and things like that. So as you know, Ryan kind of mentioned before, it's not just college, but the vast majority of people use it for college. But over the last five years, there have been a lot of changes to 529 accounts where it's increasing the amount of flexibility you do have with the account. But as Ryan also mentioned, it's not perfect. So there are ways that you could add in another account to satisfy the goals that you want to satisfy for your child that you know might help them to you know pay for other things other than college. So thank you for helping us to unravel that. But guys, I, I know the last episode we talked, you know, Roth 401ks and your employer having the option to make matching contributions with Roth dollars. That's huge. Yeah, that's one of the bigger ones. So if you guys did not listen to that episode, go and check it out. It's very, I try to go as far into the details without boring you guys <laughs> with the details. And then this one, 529 account. So if you have a child or planning on having kids into the future, you definitely want to know these rules. Again, all going into effect in 2024, but I want you guys to know this stuff now. So with that, Ryan, I... Thank you for coming on, telling us about your story and helping. Thanks for having me. Changes with the 529 accounts. And yeah, Joe, I'll bring you back on. We'll talk all about real yeah. estate more for selfish reasons because I need to get into the real estate market. <laughs> Where can everyone find you? Where can they go and use HomeDime? Yeah, so it, I'm on all social platforms. So if you Google the Money CEO, I'm on all platforms. Feel free to you know follow along. If you need a if you need a good realtor, you can check out HomeDime.com. It's home and then like the coin Dime.com or follow us on Instagram at HomeDime. And yeah, so that's where you can find me. Awesome. And hey, thanks for coming on, and we'll catch you next time, guys, on the next episode yeah. of the Bear Wallet Podcast. Thanks for tuning in to the Better Wallet Podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you found any value, we'd appreciate a rating and review.